What's up guys? Welcome to our video on how to play the Benko Gambit. Now I do realize this is a topic that we did cover very recently with a game between Andrew Tang against Magnus Carlsen in the How to Beat D4 video. But let's go a little bit deeper and see another game where Carlsen recently used the Benko to defeat another promising young player. This one being Domaraju Gukesh, one of the youngest grandmasters of all time from India in a Carlsen Challengers event on Chess24. So after B takes, C takes B5 and now A6. Well, now we get to go deeper into the move B takes A6 that was played. And here Carlson actually followed my recommendation from the previous video of not automatically taking out pawn on A6. You'd be surprised how many players just will take a pawn automatically or take a piece without even thinking about it. And obviously saying maybe there's an alternative, maybe there's a better move here. And well, Carlson played the move G6. And like I said, I think that White's best approach here is to play Knight C3. And after Bishop G7, E4, well... Those of you who have watched the previous video after castles and knight f3, well, this is a good point to test your knowledge and see if you can find the best move for black in this position to try to get some benefit from the fact that we haven't taken the pawn on a6 just yet. So while you're thinking about it, do make sure to like the video as well. It all helps boost the algorithm so that more and more people can see the power of playing the Benko and be terrified of playing one d4 as white. All right, after knight f3, black played the move queen to a5. Oh, I didn't play the move, but this is the move that he should play. And it's actually a very nice trap that I want to share with you. I actually created it in my winning openings traps course, which I'll put the link in the description below. And that is where White played the move bishop to d3. But bishop d3 is actually a mistake in this position. In fact, no less a player than Boris Gelfand, a world championship finalist in 2012, played this move, in fact, against Carlsen. But unfortunately, it runs into the move knight takes d5. The point being that with the attack after ed5 and bishop c3, well, White is just going to lose material here because after B takes C3 and Queen takes C3, unfortunately there is a fork on the King and on the Rook. And if you defend that Rook with Bishop to D2, then your Bishop on D3 is hanging. And unfortunately, with that White King in the center and his pawns right for the plucking, Black is going to win from this point. Well, unless you have a hard attack at the board or something. Uh, so therefore, White should instead play to move Bishop D2. But now we can play bishop takes a6, and you might wonder, well, Max, this is a bit different to the normal bishop a6 takes f1 lines. Now, can't I just play bishop a6 and castle? Well, here's where we interrupt and play the move queen a6. And that's why we put the queen on a5, so we can take with the queen and make it very hard for white to get the king castled here. That's the reason why you're more often going to see white play a move like bishop to e2, just keeping the tension. But we can still take with bishop takes, queen e2. And still the move queen a6 is still very decent for black as a possibility here. We're just going to take the queen, go e6 and kind of go after that e d5 pawn with some quite good play. Also another approach you can go for is to play the move d6, which might actually be a more flexible move order, where you wait for him to castle and only then play bishop e2 and queen a6. So that way if they do trade the queens, well their king is not in the center and we can develop the knight and get our rook to attack this pawn. I do have to admit that the position is still a bit better for white if he turns down the trade of queens, but this game actually shows a very instructive point that after queen takes and knight takes, because mostly I mentioned before in different videos that when you're up material, then you generally want to exchange the material, like the queens and pieces, so that your extra pawn becomes more valuable. The Benko is a very unique gambit in that the trade of queens actually helps black here, and the reason is that now some of these squares are a lot weaker and much harder to defend without a queen or without a bishop. For example, if you play something like rook fe1, you're already asking for knight b4 and already moves like knight d3 and knight c2 forks leading to all kinds of problems. And the rook is just going to back up the attack with, you know, rook to b8. Knight d7 is going to also bring the bishop to life. And we can see white really is having a hard time to defend his weaknesses on the queen's side without the queens on the board. Of course, white can improve on his play and probably queen d1 is a little better for white. But still after knight d7, rook to b8 and the ideas I showed you in the previous video but with the Carlsen, with the Tang Carlsen game, well, you can use that to still get very good practical compensation. Where well, I think that if you'd had a game where a couple club players played this position a hundred times, the black would emerge with a very nice plus score. So that's what I mean about having a strong practical weapon here as black. Well, of course, black can play different moves. I do think that the move a7 does make the... Uh, is a quite a nice idea where you're sort of trying to avoid queen to a5. But in that case, you can still go e6 and trade. And the position is a bit worse for black, but it's still relatively playable. And also if they do play moves like, let's say, uh, bishop to e c4, then yeah, you can still play moves like a d6 and bishop a6 and still get normal Benko style play, even though admittedly white is still a bit better. But you know, we are playing the Benko. This is the price we pay for getting that 55% score with black at the club level. 
is that if Y plays correct, they get a bit of a pull. But you can trust me from my experience of playing the bank point hundreds of games that basically they almost never find the best moves with White, even at a high level. And actually in this game, Gukesh did not manage to find the best move. He played the move of knight to f3, which I would say is already a slight concession. After bishop g7, we see that Carlsen decides once again not to take that pawn on a6, but just to castle and say, well, I don't care if you play e4. Instead, Gukesh played this up with g3, basically trying to go for a fiend keto, making sure this king is very well protected and avoiding any of these bishop a6 to f1 shenanigans. But this is where the delayed move order of not playing the move bishop a6 really comes to the fore. Now, Carlsen played the move d6, and after bishop to g2, well, you might think that black took the pawn on a6, but actually Carlsen played it a very different way. What do you think is the move that Magnus played at this point with black to move? So while I have that drink of water, well, that's your chance to hit that subscribe button in order to be updated with more of my uh, YouTube chess videos uh, from me, Gia Max. So let's continue on with the game. Now you could play a move like knight takes a6 and try to pressure the pawn, but I like the move that Carlsen played better. He played a move of bishop to f5 with the idea of trying to go knight e4 and get that knight into the position. The way that I personally like to play it is black is to go knight b to d7 and then meet castles with knight b6. And this might seem like a weird move, but you're basically putting pressure on the pawn to limit white's options. So that if they do play a move like b3, which is surprising how many people have played this against me, then you go knight fd5 and with that tactic you actually win material down the long diagonal, which is always fun to get such moves in. Or if they try to play a move like rook b1, trying to prepare b3 without running into the knight d5 trick, well in that case we can play bishop f5 with a tempo. They don't have a better move than rook to a1 and you know, after moves like rook a6, black's just getting really strong pressure against the a2 and d5 pawns, which leaves him very, very comfortable. Again, you would be surprised how many times I got this in blitz games and just managed to win relatively comfortably from here. I mean, one point with that would be 60 good times you can put the knight on a4 and trade off the knight that way. And also because we can put the knight on c4 and try to attack the pawn on uh, on c on our b2 uh, in such a position. I realize it's a lot of arrows, but you can't get the idea knight a4 or knight c4 and go after that b2 pawn. Well, after bishop f5, actually Gukesh found a very good move for white in this position. He realized that if black gets in knight e4, then both those bishops have very active diagonals. So he took j2 a little bit of prophylaxis and played the move knight d2, stopping knight e4 and preparing to kick the bishop away with e4. So Carlson changed tack and played knight a6. White played the move e4, which it's a move that looks very aggressive, but I actually think that it's a move that can sometimes be a mistake in the Benko. And the reason for that is that you're weakening these squares on d3 and c4. Now, just imagine if a knight gets to d3, that would be really scary for white. Uh, so instead, I think that a move like knight c4 would be a better way to play. You know, I think that Gukesh was probably nervous about knight b4 and a knight coming into c2. But white can consolidate with knight e3, and that would probably give him a little bit of a pull with best play. Though, of course, after queen c8, like black is still getting compensation, and still it's not that easy to resist the pressure from the rooks on those open files in the middle game. Because uh, up to e4, now black played bishop g4, which is just a nice move to kind of force a little bit of a weakening move like f3, or at least to provoke this weakening. And then the bishop slides all the way back to c8. Now, those of you who have seen this first time, I think, you know, is this really Magnus Carlsen and not, you know, his, like, uh, sort of double playing here as black? But actually, the idea of bishop c8 is that we want to bring the bishop back to a6. Keeping in mind that white's committed the bishop to g2, so that's a very beautiful open diagonal for the bishop now that white pawn has moved. Well, I played a move a3, trying to stop the knight coming into b4. And Carlson said, nah, I'm going to play knight b4 anyway. But admittedly, it probably wasn't the best move. I think that e6 and playing it, in a similar way to what we saw in the Andrew Tang game last time, with opening up that center and showing up some weaknesses, was probably the way to get an edge. Well, the game saw knight b4, and after knight b3, it is true that with this rook defended, that a b4 is a threat. Uh, so therefore, black played knight a6, admitting the mistake. And after castles, then another maneuver that's very thematic in these positions for black, which is to play knight d7 and allow that bishop to have a nice open view of that long diagonal. Uh, we got it right in the end. And we see that therefore the port 9 c3 will also come under pressure. And I think to also keep in mind is that after bishop b3 and a move queen b6 that happened in the game, we can see that move a3 was actually quite a subtle but quite significant weakening because now that b3 knight is very vulnerable to a rook b8 attack. And if that knight has to move, then that pawn on b2 could easily fall right after it. And I find very often in the bank that if you're able to crash through on b2, that the whole white position just often collapses after that, because that bishop will have no rival, as it were. 
Well, I might play to move Rook B1 here. Maybe Rook F2 is a better try, but okay, when you're playing against Carlsen, it's not always so easy to find the very best moves, especially when it's a Blitz game like this. Well, Carlsen played Knight C7, and it's also at one point we see that the Knight on A6, that there'll be some positions you see where the Knight normally goes to D7, but A6 could also have some potential in order to go Knight B5 and try to trade off the Knight in this particular way. You know, definitely having a flexibility of the Benko is one thing we can really use to our advantage in order to get those wins on the board, even against GMs, as I've done in my own games. Well, I played knight d2 trying to defend. You know, maybe a move like rookie one might have been better because I would personally be very nervous about knight e5 and knight coming into d3 or even c4. But if you have the option to go knight d 2 or knight c1 in reserve, at least it gives you that little bit of flexibility to try to cover either a move, uh, depending on which one looks more scary. Well, I played knight d2. Black went bishop a6, rook f2. And now Carlson played move rook fb8, which is a very thematic move in the position. Although I think that bring that 9 in a d3 outpost, like that would have been too good for me to resist personally. You know, we're already familiar with the power of the octopus right in the heart of the enemy territory. Uh, just devouring everything in this path. So now Gukesh played bishop f1, which I think is a good defensive move because I find very often that against the Benko, you want to try and get a blockade on these uh, light squares. Because if you're able to get a knight on c4 and a knight on b5 backed up, well, it means it's very hard to get those Quope and queenside files. So that's something you usually try to avoid when you're playing as black. Well, the game continued, Bishop takes f1, and unfortunately this is where White started to slip up a bit, where I think he had to play the move Rook Queen takes f1 in order to try to support his knight coming to c4 and getting that sort of queenside blockade I mentioned. I mean, it's not really very successful because Black does have ways to deal with it. For example, even a radical move like Bishop c3 is not one we should completely disregard. I know that the Dragon players here will be sort of rolling in their, well, I was going to say rolling in their graves, but obviously you're not, wouldn't be watching as if you're dead, right? But, you know, in this case, after bc3, queen a5, we see that these two pawns are both under attack. So it's a good attack to keep in mind that sometimes you can actually give up your prize bishop on g7 in order to get the pawn back and say, well, okay, you're not in a position to make my king anyway because you don't have the space and you don't have the open lines and all that. Uh, so I might play king f1 instead and, well, Carlson pounced here with the move queen to a6. It's not just a check, but you're also lining up for a knight e5 and knight d3 that can be very annoying. And in the game after queen e2, black played bishop takes c3. You know, I did mention before that this was coming. After b takes c3, and now queen takes a3. Well, we see that black has regained the pawn and still has his initiative, still has the attack against white's queenside pawns. So it's ultimately just a very depressing position for white here. And Carson managed to finish it with a plum. Playing rook takes b8, rook takes b8. Gukes tried to move c4, desperately trying to hang on to the pawns. But after knight e5, we can see what is often a common theme in the Benko. Where somehow white has his space disadvantage and black just takes all the weak squares himself. So we had king to g2. Carlson played the move rook to b2, which is certainly fine, although I think that dropping knight to d3 immediately might have been a bit more precise. But in the game, white kind of wasn't able to find a good defense. You know, maybe bishop f4 and try and trade the knight. Maybe it's a better try, but it still is a very passive position. You know, we've got all these pieces lined up and just killed by one rook. I mean, imagine, like, the rook is probably, like, having a field day, like, you know, I'm stopping all these pieces. I should get a pay raise, dear king. Anyway, the game saw f4, and after knight d3, it all starts to fall apart for white after rook f3. And queen c3, it's just very hard to even come up with a resentable move for white. Like, you want to move the bishop and attack the knight, but if you do that, you're running into the move of rook takes d2, taking knight, and also defending your knight on their d3. And, well, in the game, White played the move of king to h3 as sort of, well, what else do I do kind of move. And then Carson cashed in with queen takes c4, using the pin on the knight. So if knight takes c4, rook e2. Well, Black is up a pawn and he's going to play a move like f5 next move. Let's say a move like, for example, I don't know if White plays rook f1, then f5. And once that pawn gets traded from e4, the d5 pawn is also going to be taken off the board. And with two extra pawns, you know, you don't have to be Carson to win this as Black. Instead, white played queen f1, and after queen c2, it's just all really bad for white. You know, if you play f5, the knight gets a juicy e5 outpost. And in the game, after e5, black just took the pawn, knight d5, f5, and, you know, after the move knight e5, well, white finds out he didn't want to donate the rest of his material to the Carlson cause, and therefore Gukesh resigned here as white. So, as you can see, a very fun game where basically Carlson makes sure all of the main ideas of the Benko Gambit, and the great thing is that you can also play this in a very similar way. Against the other moves as well, like for example, if white were to play, let's say, knight to f3, you know, it can still go g6, bishop g7. The one difference is you might take on c4 later, so you kind of get a similar sort of structure. But where you're not sacking a pawn, 
you know, for example, queen c2 takes and, you know, it's kind of a normal sort of Benko position, like bishop g7. And obviously the same idea as like bishop a6 and putting knight on b6 are still very much possible here as well. If you want a lazy way to kind of play the same way, almost no matter what white does, well, you can certainly go for this. It's not always going to be the best way to play, of course, where there's certain lines like this one, where white does get a bit of an advantage with best play. But you can't get to stick to your usual sub, but it's definitely a way to make sure you at least get a playable position out of the opening each time. So yeah, with that being said, well, just a reminder that Benko Gambit that we looked at was with c5 and b5. And then this idea of delaying the move bishop a6 in order to instead castle the king immediately and get some benefit out of delaying bishop a6 by instead playing more in the center with our pieces. So as always, you know, if you learned something new from this video, you know, do let us know in the comments, you know, what you enjoyed about the video, any new points that you kind of took away as well. And also subscribe to keep up to date with more of my Grandmaster Chess video content. So that being said, good luck with playing the Benko in your own games. It's an opening that has given me a massively high performance rating in my games in the past on chess.com. So it's a very powerful weapon, certainly in Blitz, but also in Classical. So good luck with it, and I'll see you in the next video for that next chess opening to beat.